Boa tarde a todos. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Crystal Norman. I'm the Deputy Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Lisbon, and thank you for coming to the U.S. Embassy Storyteller Summit. We're so happy to have all of you here. It's going to be a fantastic session, um, and it should be very interesting. First, I want to give a special thanks to U.S. Embassy Angola um, and all the schools and the teachers present today from Angola. Welcome, uh, Vosh Vindas. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to my colleague, uh, Lashana Johnson, and also Ana Ferreira for helping recruit all of these students. I think we have almost 75 students today. Um, and a special thanks to Lashana for helping to moderate this session. Um, I also want to thank my team at the embassy, the incredible team, and specifically uh, Vito and Teresa, but Teresa, who many of you know, our youth outreach coordinator who helped recruit the more than 250 students and teachers from Portugal that we have today. Um, and I also want to thank uh, our another one of our partners, the U.S. Embassy, um, excuse me, the Angolan Embassy in Lisboa. Um, we have here uh, Senora uh, Dita Cultural, uh, Cultural Attaché, Senora Luandino Carvalho. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presence and for your embassy support of today's programs and our Black History Month programming in general. And I'd like to thank our guest speaker, uh, Ochali, who I will introduce a little bit later. Um, she's a fantastic young person and has a lot to contribute um, to this world. So with that, I will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm glad to see we have so many students and, and teachers and we'll you know, thank people at the end of the program. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start our presentation. All right, so welcome again to the US Embassy's Storyteller Summit um, in celebration of Black History Month. All right, so what are the goals of this presentation? The goals are highlight five well-known African-American authors and storytellers. We are also going to be discussing the stories of important figures of African descent on both sides of the Atlantic. And we'd love to inspire young people to share their stories through an interview and question and answer session with published author O. Chali. So Black history is American history. I wanted to start off with that because it's very important um, to understand that Black history is American history. Uh, we celebrate Black History Month to discuss the harmful effects of racism and discrimination, underscore the diversity of American history, and highlight our shared history, culture, and values. So what is Black History Month? Black History Month is actually one of the most widely celebrated American federal months. It was originally called um, and established in 1926 Negro History Week by noted African-American author and Harvard University scholar, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. So he really wanted to use Black History Month as a way to remind all Americans of their ethnic roots and that in hope that this commemoration would increase mutual respect. So in 1976, the celebration was actually expanded to include the Tyra Month, and it became known as Black History Month, or some call it African American History Month. The month of February was chosen since it contains the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. President Lincoln is honored because of the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves, and Frederick Douglass is honored as one of the most influential moral leaders of American history. Today, many people use this month to broadly celebrate people of African descent in general. So this is called the Storyteller Summit. Why is storytelling important? Well, number one, it highlights important values. Storytelling really allows people to identify with characters from stories whose values they can emulate um, or um, adopt or stories with meaningful messages, messages that really will resonate with the target audience. It also can increase cultural understanding because telling stories opens the readers up to new things, whether it's new places, new cultures, new traditions, places that typically might not be accessible otherwise. 
And then it fosters imagination. Storytelling really encourages the reader's imagination to just run wild, reinforcing the importance of cultivating a strong sense of creativity. So now we're gonna talk about five African-American storytellers um, that really stand out in terms of black history and are really important to Amer American history in general. And we'll start with James Baldwin. Again, novelist, playwright, essayist, poet, and activist. And his essays um, collected in a notes of a native son, um, explore the intricacies of race, identity, and class distinctions in the United States during the mid 20th century. He does discuss black people's aspirations. What do they wanna be you know, in the future, but their disappointments as well and coping strategies. How did they manage the stress of all of the tensions and the discrimination that they faced during the civil rights movement? And so I wanted to share a quote from James Baldwin that I think is very powerful. James Baldwin says, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. And when he says her in this instance, he's referring to America. So this makes me think of accountability. Storytellers use their stories to hold America accountable for its actions and inaction during the civil rights movement. Our first amendment of the constitution, freedom of speech protects that right and Baldwin's works promoted critical thinking and debate, important values in American society. Next, we have Langston Hughes, and I'm a huge fan of Langston Hughes. He was an American poet, social activist, novelist, playwright, and columnist, and one of the early innovators of the art form called jazz poetry. Hughes is best known as a leader of the Harlem Renaissance. And Hughes also sought to honestly portray the joys and hardships of working class Black people, avoiding both idealization, which is a kind of romanticized everything's great view, um, and negative stereotypes. And for those who don't know, the Harlem Renaissance was a very important um, rebirth of the celebration of Black leaders and Black artists that took place in Harlem, New York, and was kind of the center and the mecca of Black creation, um, expression, and creativity during that time. So Langston Hughes had a really um, important uh, poem, and he says, I, too, Excuse me. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Then besides they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. And so what do we learn from Hughes in this? This really speaks to me because of the concept of inclusion. Storytellers use their stories to criticize policies like segregation, which was the forced separation of white and black people um, in their early part, in every part of um, during that time. Um, and this poem alludes to this idea of segregation, of him eating in the kitchen, of everyone else eating at the table. Um, and it's through valuing inclusion, uh, when we ensure that all people have a seat at the same table, that we can truly appreciate the richness of America's diversity. I too am America. So now we go to Maya Angelou, who is also, um, you know, a really, really, really important figure um, in, in when talking about Black History Month. Maya Angelou was an American poet, memoirist, and civil rights activist. She published three books of essays, several books of poetry, 
and is credited with a list of plays, movies, and television shows spanning over 50 years. Maya Angelou is best known for her series of seven autobiographies, which focus on her childhood and early adult experiences. Now, this is actually one of my favorite woman, which is one of her poems. And she says, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. So what can we learn from Maya Angelou in, in, in this piece? And I always think about the importance of resilience. Storytellers use their stories to highlight the resilience of women, particularly Black women, despite all of the odds they had to overcome as being part of two minority groups. It's a way to say, no one can appreciate me more than I can. A positive, a positive affirmation needed during tough times. And now we have Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord was an American writer, feminist, womanist, librarian, and civil rights activist. She dedicated both her life and creative talent to confronting and addressing discrimination based on gender, identity, and economic status. Now, as a poet, she was known for honestly sharing her feelings about social injustices that she observed throughout her life. Now, we are going to hear one of, one of my favorite quotes from Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So what can we learn from Audre Lorde about um, from, this, from this quote? And I think it speaks to representation. Representation, storytellers use their stories to highlight um, the courageous actions of all of those black history makers who dared to be the first to do something great. She discusses the power of aligning your passion and your purpose to break barriers just like Vice President Kamala, just like Vice President Kamala Harris um, has done as the first Black woman, as the first woman, um, as the first Asian person, and the first Black person, person of color, to hold this office. And finally, we have one of the great minds, contemporary writers, Tennessee Coates. Tennessee Coates is an American author and journalist and Coates gained a wide readership as a writer at The Atlantic, where he wrote about cultural, social, and political issues, particularly regarding African-Americans and racism. He has also written um, a Black Panther and Captain America series for Marvel Comics. So I'm sure many of you are, fam are familiar with Captain America. Um, if, if you are, if you have, read Captain America or Black Panther, please share it in the chat. It's definitely two of the most um, widely read comics. And as you you probably are also know, um, when the Black Panther film came out, it was one of the first films with an all Black um, leading cast, and it grossed over $1 billion worldwide, a huge testament to the importance of telling diverse stories about people from diverse backgrounds. Now let's go to a quote from Mr. Coates. He says, outside of hip hop, it was in comics that I most often found the aesthetics and wisdom of the world reflected. So what can we learn from Tennessee nehisi Coates through this quote? And I think we speak to identity. Storytellers can use their stories to bridge the world of reality and inspiration, despair and hope inclusion and exclusion. Sometimes bringing these worlds together can happen through writing, it can happen through music, in this case, comics. But it all speaks to wanting to create an identity that is more complex than some of the stereotypes forced upon certain communities. So what do all of these stories have in common? They really told 
their stories about their struggles, about their triumphs, about their beauty and the importance of sharing their voice courageously from their perspective. And I think we can learn a lot from the storytellers highlighted in this storyteller summit um, from the perspective of how do we want to share and continue to uplift those who dare to tell their stories. Even if we don't agree, even if it's something that we have never experienced or never seen before, how do we continue to come to a space where we can appreciate everyone's contributions to the table. Now we're going to do a little bit of trivia. And this trivia comes from a, a great video that Google did. It's called The Most Search, a celebration of Black history makers. Okay, so what, what Black history makers did we recognize from that video? Go ahead and share it in the chat. If you saw someone that you recognize, go ahead and share it in the chat. So we have Rihanna, someone said Beyonce, LeBron James, Rosa Parks, RuPaul, Little Nas X, Martin Luther King. Oh, that's great, LeBron James. We have some fans of LeBron James here. That's awesome. Okay, so, here. John Legend. Okay, that's great. So I'm glad everybody recognized at least one person from that great montage. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was Google's 2020 Black History Month video, and it's based on 15 years of search data collected through 2004 um, through July 2019. And this was a way to showcase the most searched topics um, and consequently the most iconic results in Black history. So I'm just gonna go through a few of them because I think some of them really merit um, uh, discussing. Um, we have the most searched abolitionists and an abolitionist is someone who advocates for the, the elimination of slavery. So does anybody, did anybody recon recognize the abolitionist who is highlighted in this video? I did mention him at the beginning of my presentation. He's one of the reasons um, why Black History Month is in February. Does anybody remember? Lincoln, the other person, Frederick Douglass. Exactly, Frederick Douglass. So slavery and abolitionists um, shaped much of Black history and written works and influential words made by Frederick Douglass, one of America's most well-known abolitionists and the most searched um, as he still makes history today. Okay, so that was Frederick Douglass. We also had the most searched athlete. Did anybody catch who was the most searched athlete highlighted in that film? Okay, Michael Jordan was there. Michael Jordan was there, but he actually was not the most searched athlete. Yes, LeBron James. Uh, Michael Jordan was actually highlighted because he has the best, uh, the best dunk, the most searched dunk, but LeBron James is actually the most searched uh, athlete. Um, he holds many titles, including the most searched um, athlete and basketball player in the United States. He's a three-time NBA champion, um, and he goes beyond basketball, really notably opening a new public school in his hometown of Akron. Um, the I Promise School actually supports disadvantaged children in the Ohio area. So that's really, really great. Who's a fan of LeBron James? Share it in the chat. Oh, is it Michael Jordan's birthday today? What a fantastic uh, coincidence. Yeah. Um, and now we go to the most searched ballerina. Did anybody catch who is the most searched ballerina? She was featured. Did anybody see the most searched ballerina? Simone Biles, no, not quite. We're gonna talk about Simone later. Okay, so the most searched ballerina is actually Misty Copeland. 
With four times more search interest than the next most searched ballerina, Misty Copeland's Google Trend Statistics led her to the legacy of breaking barriers. In September 2014, she became the first African-American to star in the American Ballet Theater production of Swan Lake, um, becoming a role model for young ballerinas everywhere. So Misty Copeland is fantastic. Oh, I see Ochali mentions Misty Copeland. Uh, she is, is fantastic and highlighted during the, the most searched video. All right, the most searched boycott. Did anybody catch what is the most searched boycott? Most searched boycott. There was a really pivotal pivot. Okay, yes, yeah, someone said Rosa Parks. Perfect. So yes, you're correct. Rosa Parks refusal to give up her seat on the bus helped spark the civil rights movement and decades later, America's most searched boycott, which is the Montgomery bus boycott. For more than a year, black Americans joined the first US mass demonstrations against segregation, a pivotal moment in black history. So yes, Rosa Parks, Montgomery bus boycott, a really important pivotal moment in American history. Okay, so now we have the most searched guitar solo. Did anybody catch what black history maker was rocking, rocking it on, on the guitar? Yes, we saw Prince, 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 Prince. Any Prince fans here? Wow, everybody got that one. Great, so Prince, Prince's guitar solo, um, has more U.S. searches than any other artist guitar solos in Google Trends history. Some of, his, some, of, some of his famous solos, including him showcasing his talents on guitar strings during Purple Rain and While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Prince was pretty, pretty awesome. Okay, we have a couple more. Now we go on to the most searched gymnast. I think someone said it earlier. Who is the most searched gymnast? Yes, Simone Biles, Simone Biles, that's great. At just 22 years old, Simone Biles is tied for the most decorated American female athlete, leaping her way to 30 Olympic and world championship titles. Her legacy will live beyond the team um, with the incredible gymnastics moves that she has named after her. So it's great to see so many people know who Simone, Simone Biles is. She's definitely one of the leaders of the next generation and at the top of her league in terms of sports. Okay, this, is, this might be a tricky one. Um, Hidden Figures was a great film, but did anybody catch the most searched NASA mathematician? Did anybody catch the most searched NASA mathematician? Katherine Johnson, yes, great. Katherine Johnson's celeb calculations helped put people into orbit around the earth and then onto the moon. Shortly after the biographical film, Hidden Figures was widely released in January, 2017, um, search interest for Johnson peaked, making her one of the most recognizable public figures, um, black public figures in the science world. So she was, incredibly um, important to some of our, our most, um, our proudest NASA, NASA accomplishments. And has anybody seen the movie Hidden Figures? Go ahead and, and share it in the chat if you've seen Hidden Figures. Yes, great, 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 great. You know, fantastic movie and about you know, women who really helped shape science. And again, um, hidden figures because they are not always celebrated in the way that they are, but it's so great to see that more people know about them and recognize the importance of their contributions. Okay, we have two, three more. The most searched tennis player. Did anybody catch the most searched tennis player? Serena, yes, you are correct, Serena Williams. If you can imagine, Serena Williams has 23 Grand Slam single titles, 14 women doubles titles, and four Olympic gold medals. She has established her preeminence in the sport. 
and she has more U.S. search interest than Wimbledon, which is tennis's oldest tournament. Um, yeah, what else can we say? She, she is fantastic. She is definitely competing at the very, very, very top of her sport um, and a true Black history maker. Okay, the most searched World World II airmen. Who knows who are the most searched World 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 War II airmen? Does anybody know? Yes, somebody said Tuskegee already. Absolutely, the Tuskegee Airmen. The Tuskegee Airmen were the first African American U.S. military pilots who flew over 1,800 missions during World War II, and U.S. search interest really spiked after 2012 when a movie came out about them. Does anybody know what movie that was that talked about the incredible contributions uh, to World War II of the Tuskegee Airmen? Yes, Red Tails, yes, 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 you're correct. Red Tails is the movie. Definitely go and watch that movie if you hadn't got a chance to do it. Uh, Real, Red Tails talks about the incredible contributions of Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen. And last but not least, the most search speech. What was the most search speech? Yes, somebody has already guessed it. I have a dream, Martin Luther King, well done. Um, the most searched speech in America was delivered to a crowd of thousands, but Dr. Martin Luther King's words inspire millions today and is still one of the most recognizable speeches to date. So great job, everyone. You did a fantastic job on trivia. And now I want everyone to take a moment to think, what's my story? What obstacles have I overcome? What inspirational stories have not been told by people who look like me or from my community or even from my country? What messages of accountability, resilience, inclusion, identity, and representation will inspire the next generation? What is my story? I want everybody to put what's my story in the chat. I want everybody to put what's my story in the chat. We are thinking about what's my story? What story do I have to tell? Yes, yes, yes. So with that, I'd like to introduce our live uh, storyteller spotlight for today, Ochali. And our guest speaker, um, Ochali, has thought a lot about that, those questions, and much, much more. And in the spirit of discussing the stories of important figures of African descent on both sides of the Atlantic, it is my pleasure to introduce to the U.S. Embassy's Storyteller Summit, published author Ochali. Ochali, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, hi. Yes, well, welcome so much to the U.S. Embassy Storyteller Summit. Ochali, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. So what I want to do is tell the audience a little bit about you, and then we're going to hand it over to you to read your book, Nzinga, Aranya Angolana. Yeah. So everyone, Ochali loves to read and has read more than 2,000 books so far, if you can imagine that. Ochali also knows how to play the violin, and she speaks English, Portuguese, and some French. Um, she wrote her first book at six years old and published this book, Arena Angolana in Zynga, at 12 years old. So please join me in a warm, warm welcome to our guest author today, Ochali. Over to you, Ochali. Um, yeah, uh, so now I'm going to be reading um, my first actual published book, uh, Zynga, Arena Angolana. Um, so let's go. Yeah. Zinga, Arranha Angolana. Text by Alchali, illustrations by Isa Silva. Um, and this book is dedicated to all the women in the world that think that they're not capable of much more. Zinga, the Queen of Angola.
A few centuries ago, in the place where today is Angola, there was the kingdom of Ndungu and its capital was Kabasa. It was there that, around 1582, a girl was born who would become a very important person in the history of Angola. She was the daughter of Ngola Kiluanji and a servant woman, Ngengela Kakumba. She was given the name Zinga because she was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. In her language, Zinga means to wrap, to curl. This seems to have been a sign that she would be a different person. At that time, the king faced a war with the Portuguese because of the slave trade and their occupation of Angola lands. Created in a warlike environment, from a young age, she realized the rivalry between the two sides and the negative consequences that this had for their people. His daughter's bravery, intelligence, and determination did not go unnoticed by Angola Kilwanji. Seeing in her a successor, he taught her how to use weapons and master fighting techniques to become a warrior. She was only eight years old when he first took her to a battle. Years later, in 1617, when her father died, everyone thought that she would succeed him and become queen because that was what he had prepared her, planned her for since childhood. However, it was Zinga's brother Mbendi who ended up on the throne. People say he got it in a wrong way and they accuse him of killing his nephew, Zinga's son. But this story has never been proven to be true. During Ngolam Bendi's rule, he demonstrated that he had not inherited his father's war fighting skills, nor had the same political ambitions. As a result, the enemy was gaining more land and power, while the lives of the population became more and more difficult. In order to change the situation, Ngolam Bendi was advised to send his sister, who was an excellent diplomat, to make peace agreements with the Portuguese invaders. And so it happened. Zinga went to the Portuguese in an attempt to save her people from the miserable situation they found themselves in. In order to get them to liberate her lands, she made several alliances and even converted to Christianity as a way of showing her goodwill towards them. She was baptized in the year 1622 and received a Christian name, and it's Souza. However, the peace was short-lived. The Portuguese didn't comply with the agreement, and this generated a new state of war. One of the consequences of this happened the following year, the persecution, escape, and death of Ngolombandi. This had a short reign of only six years, however, left marks of great destruction due to bad government. Mbendi's death is still a mystery. Some say he committed suicide, and others say he was murdered by Zinga. But to this day, it is not really known what happened. In 1623, Zinga finally ascended to the coveted throne. Mad at the Portuguese, because they were not respecting their agreements and continuing to occupy the Mbundu's lands, Zinga Mbendi ceased to be a Christian and became a fierce enemy against them and allied countries of the invaders. This fight lasted almost three long and bloody decades. During this time, in the fighting, many of her warriors died, but the cunning queen always escaped unharmed. In 1644, Realizing that the Dutch colonizers wanted to conquer Angola, she joined them to prevent this from happening. Zinga Mbendi went so far as to make alliances to expel the Portuguese from the territory, but she was unsuccessful in her plan.
The year 1648 was sad for the queen because she suffered a defeat and one of her sisters was taken as a prisoner. Zinga went to Matamba, but maintained her position against the Portuguese. The following year, when the Dutch were expelled, Zinga lost allies and weapons. By this time, at the age of 67, perhaps already tired of wars, all she wanted was peace and tranquility. So she returned to embrace Christianity and resumed friendship and peace with the Portuguese, creating a peaceful relationship with them. She was in power for 40 years and all this time never wanted to be treated as queen, but always as king. In fact, it seems as if she had the strength of a man, dressed and behaved like one. She was, in every way, a very modern woman for her time, not only for her ideas, but also for her actions and behaviors. After a long and fulfilled life, she died on December 17th, 1663, at the age of 81. She was buried as a Christian, but also with the rituals of her people. Queen Zinga was undoubtedly a very insightful, intelligent woman who spoke very various languages and determined in her decisions. Fear was not on her side, and she did not give orders. She always took the initiative, always fighting for her people and her ideals. She stood out as a diplomat and strategist, possessing an enormous military capability that was even recognized by her enemies. She became the greatest source of inspiration for women due to things that only then were done by men. She was different and did not follow the usual fate of a woman of that time. She not only fought for her land, but also for the lands of other communities. And because of this, she became a symbol of resistance to the European colonists throughout the African continent. Her name has had numerous variations, such as Jinga, Jinga, Singa, Zinga, and Zinga, Dona Ana, and even Ana Zinga. But the queen is always the same, a unique and unparalleled woman of the 16th and 17th centuries who left a mark of bravery and intelligence in the, in the history of Angola. She is a part of Angolan and world history as a heroine and a national symbol of independence. Her intelligence is also compared to other great queens' intelligence, such as Zenobia, Cleopatra, Elizabeth I of England, and Catherine, the Great of Russia. The end. Oh, great job. Yes, everybody give her a virtual round of applause. That was fantastic. Let's go straight to the questions. I'll hand it over to Lashana to ask the first two and then we'll open it up. Okay. Good afternoon, Ochali. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I just want to relate to you from the chat. Everyone is so inspired um, by your book and had a lot of great questions for you. So first question that everyone really wants to know is, what inspired you to tell the story of Queen and Zinga? Um, so originally it was for a school project, but um, during my research, um, I just fell in love with the story of Zinga and I decided to gather up my research and kind of like turn it into a book. Um, and during my research, I got the opportunity to watch the 2013 movie, Zinga. And I read two books, um, and one was by 
Jose Eduardo Garuza, and the other was by John Bella. And um, that's kind of how um, it happened. And yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, I think that that's, that's important. And if any of you haven't seen or don't know her story, we encourage you to, of course, read Charlie's book, but check out the movie as well. That can be a fun way to yeah. learn. Um, so of course, we want to ask you, you are a very young author. Who were some of the authors that inspired you and why? Um, one, of my, one of the authors that inspired me um, is Michelle Obama because she is a very, very independent and persistent woman. And um, after I had read um, her book, Becoming, one of the big, let's say, snippets that I had remembered from the book was when she had gone to talk to her guidance counselor about colleges. And she said that she wanted to get into Princeton, but um, her guidance counselor told her that she could never get into Princeton. And if I'm quoting this correctly, she says in her book, and I quote, she says, um, after she had told me that I couldn't get into Princeton, I made it my mission to get into Princeton and she made it into Princeton. And so she kind of proved her guidance counselor wrong just by getting into Princeton. And um, yes, that. And then another author that really inspires me is Otoniela Bzeha. Um, she used to be my mentor. Um, so she kind of guided me in the steps of becoming a writer and um, publishing the book and having to like deal with everything. And um, she is a very, very inspiring woman to me because um, I can always look up to her if I need help with anything. And um, she's always gonna be there for me if I ever need help with anything. And um, it's kind of also thanks to her that I kind of like took the steps to becoming an author and actually publishing my book. No, that's awesome. And those are great mentors and inspirations to have. Um, so I share some of those as well. So thank you so much for sharing. We'll go ahead straight into the chat because the audience is sitting on the edge of their seats and have so many great questions for you. Um, I am so happy that one of the first questions is from right here in Luanda, Angola, from Complexo Escolar Martinez de Uganda. And Adelaide submitted a question asking you, did you ever have any hesitation in starting to write? Um, as we know, you're, you're very young. Most of us have never written a book um, and we're older than you. How did you get started writing? What, did you ever have any feelings or any nervousness about that? Um, no, not before actually like doing the whole process. No, because um, my parents and um, my family, they were always super supportive of me and they were always there to help me with anything. And so it was very, very calm. And um, yeah, I never actually had any hesitations. Um, and we never, I never had any hesitations on anything so yes no, that's awesome. sometimes when you're doing the thing that you're called to do you have no fear right you get to be really yeah. really great yeah so that's it's important. like calling from god exactly all right so we have bashful asked you how did you manage to write a book at six years old kind of similar to what we've been talking about but particularly what kept you motivated we know that writing can be really hard how did you stay motivated to finish your book even um so I, it was actually for school. I was like in the first grade and we had to write about an important American figure because then we were going to write like a small book and then present it to our parents. And um, I remember thinking, oh, I have this book at home about Rosa Parks. What if I wrote a book about Rosa Parks? And so, um, I started writing a little, I wrote like a small book on Rosa Parks and um, <laughs> and it was a very, very small book. It gave like the basic details why she wouldn't get up from her seat. And then I remember getting up there in front of all of the parents and then presenting my story and then walking down from let's say like the little podium and feeling so proud of myself because I had just done the impossible. Um, and I was very, very, very proud of myself. 
Um, I just have one more question from the chat. Someone asked, yeah. how long did it take you from the English Friendship Club of Angola? We're very happy to see you guys. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? Um, the publishing, the editing is what took the most time, but the actual, like, the, the editing, the publishing, and the research, those are the parts that took the most time. But once I had all my research gathered and I just sat down to, like, actually, like, write it in, like, a draft, took me about like less than an hour and a half because I already had all my research and all I had to do was transfer my research onto a piece of paper. And since I can fluently speak Portuguese and English, it was a bit easy for me to do the translation from Portuguese to English and English to Portuguese. So it wasn't, it didn't take that long. The only parts that actually took that long were the editing, the publishing, the printing, and the, the research. Awesome. So we have some future storytellers, we hope, in the audience. Can you explain to them why you think it's important for young people to tell and share their stories? Um, I have actually three reasons. Um, so my first reason is that so that people can understand other people's point of view and kind of like understand what their lives are like and to also maybe understand that other people might be experiencing the same feelings and the same things as them and that was my first reason and then my second reason is because it's important for young people to share their stories so that they can improve their create their creativity which can be very useful for school or for future jobs and my third reason is to help foster and improve imagination. And again, linking with creativity, imagination is very important for people because it helps them, let's say, it also helps them dream better, helps them dream big. Um, and it always helps them like think outside the box, um, think, make, it helps them think that, no, I can do this, I believe that I can. And it's very, very interconnected with creativity. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Um, so we'll leave with this last question. What advice would you give the young writers in the audience who want to be a published author like you? Um, my first and most like the first and most important thing for you to do is just dream big. Just put your mind into it and believe that you can do it and always aim for the stars. Um, just think outside the box, um, dream the impossible, um, and really believe that you can, because if you don't believe that you can, I mean, you don't really have the motivation that you need to like do it. And um, if you don't really have writing habits, um, that's okay. Um, you don't have to be like a professional like writer. You don't have to sit down and write. 50 pages every day to become a good writer. You can start with something simple, like after school, write how you're feeling or how your school day was, um, or in the morning when you wake up um, before you go to school, you can write about how you think your day is going to be. Um, and also start by writing things, start by writing about things that you like, like let's say you're, you just love, um, art, right? Start by writing things about art. Like, um, let's say you're walking down the street and you see this beautiful painting. Start by writing about that. Write about how you felt when you saw it. Write about the colors, everything that you saw, and just write it down. And just my first grade teacher used to tell me this all the time. Her name was Miss Madonna, and she used to tell me, Grace, Oh, Charlie, you have so much potential. Just put your ideas, all of your ideas, just put them down on a piece of paper. And um, <laughs> that was, that's, that's some of my biggest advice for you. And um, you should always just try your best and believe that you really can, because I believe in you, you know? I believe in you. I believe that you can. No, that's, that's awesome, awesome advice. And I'm actually, I couldn't have asked you to end on a better note because I do have a quote from my favorite storyteller. Really? Um, 
Yes, Toni Morrison. She's one of my favorites. And she said, if there is a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. And Toni Morrison is a well-known African-American writer. Of course, she passed in 2019, but she's well-known as a Pulitzer Prize winner and a Nobel Prize uh, in literature. And so I think, O'Charlie, you're an awesome company with your inspirational words. If everyone could leave a round of applause for O'Charlie in, uh, in your reactions and in the comments. Um, we love your energy. We hope that you were inspired by the session today. Um, you know, grading and writing is something that really, as O'Charlie said, molds us. It allows us to tell our story. And the more that we practice telling our stories, the better we get at it. And so one day we hope that you too will join the ranks of the great leaders that we, we mentioned throughout the program today. And we hope that we'll be doing a program calling some of your names uh, in the book of history and in the great, as great storytellers. Um, so big round of applause to you, Achali. Thank you so much for your time you. and for sharing your inspiration. We do want to recognize some of our all-stars because this program could not be done without all of you in the audience here. And we thank you so much for joining. I do want to give a huge shout out to Complexo Escolar right here in Luanda. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We appreciate you. And we're so glad that you could um, be a part of this event. Additionally, the English Friendship Youth Club of Angola right here in Luanda. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming. And last but not least here in Angola, we have in Lubango province outside of uh, Luanda here, Centro de Formação Know How. Thank you guys so much for joining. Nice to see you again. And we hope that you enjoyed. We, I'll hand it over to uh, Crystal to shout out all the Portuguese schools and organizations that joined us today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lashana. And uh, that was fantastic, Ochali. Um, just to kind of echo all of the things that Lashana shared um, and also give a special thanks to all of the schools, the Escola Secundaria de Castro Verde, No Alentejo, uh, Colegio Internato dos Carvalhos, um, Escola Básica e Secundaria José Relvas, Escola Secundaria de Vila Real de Santo Antonio, New Algarve, Colegio Salesianos de Asturil, Escola Secundaria Manuel de Fonseca, Escola Secundaria de Azambuja, Escola Secundaria de Silvas e Escola Secundaria de Benavente. Obrigada, muitíssima, um, muitíssima obrigada. Um, I really, really, really appreciate uh, all of your support, your enthusiasm, your positive uh, energy towards Ochali. Um, again, we are so thrilled to have had her for this uh, U.S. Embassy Storyteller Summit in celebration of Black History Month. Uh, I want to give a, a special, special thanks to our great partners at the U.S. Embassy in Angola, the Angolan Embassy in Lisbon, and my team at the U.S. Embassy in Lisbon. A special thanks to all of the teachers and all of the students for your continued efforts during this difficult time. We hope that you and your families remain well and have a really strong end of the semester. So thank you all and appreciate you coming. Ciao. Obrigada.